So I think we should start by giving the background of... So I'm a hanger-on here. You have long admired the copy uh, in various seed catalogs. You have seed catalog preferences, which I don't think very many people can claim. Uh, I think gardeners in general can claim that. They have not, not just seed preferences, but catalog preferences. Well, I don't know. <laughs> And would their preference for a catalog be based on the quality of the copy and not the just the quality of the seeds? Well, I, I think there's a labor of love issue where if you're going to put a lot of time and effort into one, why would you not put time and effort into the other? So I think, you know, some of the more uh, conventional seed catalogs don't really put a lot of effort into their copy and that's maybe because all they can say about their vegetables is that they're very large mm. um, <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh which of course makes them taste bad right and so like the the heirloom catalogs often have better I think they have better copy describing the seeds, but it might just be that they have more to describe because they're interested in the all the variations. All right, I've made some assessments based on what's going on already, which is that I believe you are the brains of this operation <laughs> and that I should function primarily as a hype man or <laughs> like if I'm the flavor flave to your Chuck D or something like that. Uh, you know both more about seeds and about uh, writing copy, which you've done in the past. You should give that background information on yourself. Mm, well, you just did, so I don't have to. What did you write copy for? Uh, it's not. It's not interesting. Okay. Um. Anyway, I am. I guess on this podcast just to bring diversity to it <laughs> i'm a white guy so that's mm, that's, be helpful that's funny to, yeah, yeah it'll be helpful to make Provide sure we that hit our demographic marks yeah um so i think there's still some like outstanding tension on how like to what degree this should be an asmr experience and to what degree it should be talking about seeds <laughs> Uh, and I think we've, we talked about this before beginning to record, but maybe we we will treat the recitation. Oh, this is a podcast where we read uh, descriptions of seeds. <laughs> we really buried the lead there. Um, I feel like we should have like a jingle. Maybe I can write a jingle. You should write a jingle. It's CD business. Also, we can record some sort of introduction yeah, later edited, that yeah. would be edited into the beginning. Mm. The thing is that I don't know it, what kind of like a da 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 seeds like that much of a jingle. The only thing I compose is church music and ditties about murdering our cat well so, i think you can handle it though mm. our cat's name is lucy she's sitting right next to us yeah that's a, probably important for mm. people to know when i sing about murdering her it is uh, it's it's a code for loving hard you should know that also mm. uh anyway so the question is um like how much banter, how much reading with the intention of stimulating ASMR feelings. And I think we're like going to read them without interjecting, but then, uh, then discuss. Yeah. And I think, 
I think it's hard because if you're really aiming at an ASMR specific audience, um, people have a lot of variation in what triggers that for them, and they're very specific about what they want, and they become very annoyed if there are extraneous sounds or sounds that they dislike or find jarring. So, for example, I've noticed people who do ASMR videos will label them like paper rustling sounds or like mouth Oh, noises. That's a warning? To warn people. Oh, okay. I, or, I always thought that was to advertise well, those. Either themes. one. Okay. Either one. So, right. like, for some, some people like both of those sounds, which I do. I like mm-hmm. rustling of, like, thick, coarse, high-quality paper. Mm. It's not like you're describing corn on the cob. For mm. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. But, um... Yeah, so probably if we if we advertise ourselves as an ASMR experience, people are going to be we're going to get hate mail. Mm. I have to assume they do have strong opinions. I've like even ASMR, you know, exclusive videos. It'll be like a you know a young delicate blonde woman, uh, you know, uh, reading something softly or whatever, and then there'll be like an angry person underneath. It's you know, they, they need their ASMR to be read by a woman with slightly lower voice or who, like, that, you know, Yeah, the needs people are have very, very specific, specific yeah. desires. So I, I think maybe the vision here is that it's just an incredibly soothing... Uh, There's no, there's nothing to be mad about here. Mm. We're just talking about some seeds. (laughs) We're just talking about vegetable seeds and Mm. ways that they might be nice, uh, whether, whether they would be, whether they sound nice, Mm. uh, just in their names and descriptions, whether we think they would be nice to grow or look at mm. or eat. So what you're saying is seeds are apolitical. Yeah, entirely. I mean, it's not debatable entirely. actually. Unfortunately. <laughs> I know yeah, some people a... who like seeds more than other people and you put them into some categories, but yeah, I agree that uh if you're extremely liberal or extremely <laughs> conservative, that's one of those things where you go around the bend and you both meet at the we should have a, an underground seed <laughs> right, vault. Right, right, yeah. A silo. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the, what we know about preppers is that they uh, they encompass all possible extremes. Mm. Yeah, anyway, let's do it. Okay, well... Allison, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking some Genepi. Um, Yeah, it's pretty good. Also, your name's Allison. Yeah, that's right. We didn't say anything about ourselves. But again, we could we could just we record an it. intro. We the... could edit this to be whatever we want it to be. <laughs> mm. uh, I'm Roman. I'm drinking Old Granddad with St. Germain. Mm. As is our house rule. Which no one adheres to except me. St. Germain has to be in all cocktails. All right, crack that thing open. All right, What do you got for me? I guess I'll just start with some some lettuces. Mm. And this is the, by the way, this is the Seed Savers Exchange catalog. Um, 2016. It looks like I, I'm not sure if there's a month on it. So, Seed Savers Exchange 2016, Catalog of Heirloom, Untreated, Non-Hybrid, Non-GMO Seeds, Certified, USDA Organic. If you don't put a month on it, it has a timeless value. Hmm. Amish Deer Tongue. Amish variety valued for its ruggedness and heavy production. Thick, compact plant, great for a cut-and-come-again lettuce when thickly sown. Thin midrib, good texture, pleasant sharp flavor, loose leaf, 45 to 55 days. I mean, the I don't know when it's good for something to be thick and when it's good for something to be thin, but it's alternately described as both of those. Mm. Also, thick makes its way into a lot of these, and it makes me think of thick burgers every time. 
Well, sick burgers are pretty unappealing. I They're think you should edit gross. that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, we can't edit out everything that's unappealing. I think we can. I just want to say that, like, thickness as a quality to really promote, I'm not sure is appealing in and of itself. I'm not sure. I mean, here's what I think is good about this uh, copy and what I think having good quality seeds of interesting plants, um, why it promotes good copy. Because Mm -hmm. what you're interested in is, is accurately describing the qualities of the plant, because every plant you know, it's going to be, maybe it'll be a little offbeat. Maybe it'll be a little different. And whether, I'm not sure that there is an objective, like, oh, you want the ribs of your lettuce to be thick always. Maybe you want a mixture of lettuces, some Mm. with thicker and some with thinner mid ribs. Maybe you want one for one application. Yeah. I, I just, I think that they're all, the point is not to say this is the best lettuce on some sort of there's some universal scale for lettuce of worst to best (laughs) like you can line them up like that but rather it's meant to uh, tell the reader what makes this lettuce different from the other lettuce people are definitely gonna like you better on this podcast (laughs) they should i do too (laughs) It's very sensible. Everything you said is very sensible. All right, hit me. All right, I'll keep going with lettuce. Australian yellow leaf. Australian heirloom from our friends at Diggers Club near Melbourne. Very tender texture. Unique chartreuse color. Slow to bolt, large plants. Loose leaf, 50 days. I really, I didn't commit to saying Melbourne or Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> you should always take the statistical average mm. of, uh, of any word that you are uncomfortable with the pronunciation of. Yeah, I really, you should just, you should just, uh, just Melbourne. Melbourne? <laughs> um, yeah, that's nice. These are soothing. Yeah. Which catalog is this? This is the Seed Savers Exchange. Okay. Okay. Baby oak leaf. A dwarf compact version of green oak leaf. Tasty and tender medium green leaves are oak leaf shaped with rounded lobes. Holds for an extended period. Loose leaf 50 days. What do you... I'm asking you to speculate, but... Say that this is this is like primarily read by. I mean, who who gets these catalogs? There are several. We have several in front of us. They are called Seed Saver, Grow with Grow with Us in twenty six. Is that this is this is Seeds of Change? So okay. the catalogs we have right now are um, Seeds of Change, Seed Savers Exchange, and Burpee. Burpee being the that's the big name in this game, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the McDonald's. There's the McDonald's of, of seed catalogs. Yeah. Um, and I, what would you, how would you say that the like the market for each of these differs? That's a good question. I mean, and do you think that like there's some market pressure to really sex it up for like a burpees if they're appealing to a broader audience? Do you think the ones that are appealing to primarily farmers or whatever, really, they have a different sort of philosophy behind the copy? I don't know. I mean, I think everyone, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think every market, you know, whether you're sort of a small farmer selling at a farmer's market or a CSA or a weekend warrior kind of person, or maybe like a I mean, no, actually large farms are buying their seeds sure, this way. Right. Those are really the two options. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are very, very few people who are so committed to the idea of open pollinated crops that they would only grow um, these heirloom varieties. But... The thing is, if you introduce 
if you really are planning on saving all your seeds, you can't introduce a non-open pollinated tomato to your garden sure. without screwing up all your tomato seeds for the next year. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think. I mean, you've certainly noticed a copy. Di- you've uh, said on, on mm. numerous occasions that the way they write is different in each mm. of these catalogs. And that could be just a matter of who is writing for them, uh, or it could be like a specific branding decision, you know, meant to appeal to a. I guess what interests me is uh, the sort of balance of language about visual aspects versus mm. taste aspects. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if you're, say, if, if you are growing for, like, agricultural purposes, you're probably not giving a shit how they look. You are just, I mean, it, it depends who you're selling to. It really depends. I mean, I think people at the farmer's market, people who shop at a farmer's market are more appreciative of the beauty of an heirloom tomato. They don't expect their tomato to be a perfect sphere of mm. a single uniform color. But I guess if your vegetable looks too weird, maybe it would be hard to sell. <laughs> <laughs> so it needs to meet a basic threat. There's a what's that like principle of when things look shitty, the right amount, right? That's oh, I don't like know. a. I feel like there's a Japanese word for it that uh, you want like a, you want a like a pair of boots mm, that's like just the right amount of beat up. Wabi sabi. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, there's like some of that that goes into. To mm. farmer's market wares, probably. Yeah, I think that's true. So I guess that has to meet, like, a basic threshold of not looking like a disaster. <laughs> but Yeah. Well, that's that's a, probably another reason why these are so different, because the, the seed savers exchange, like, they're willing to carry things that would be unmarketable. Or like you would you would never see them in a grocery store because they are too irregular mm-hmm. or unusual. Mm, let me take a crack at one. Yeah. Let's. Why don't I? Should we get some contrast going? Should I take a different catalog? Well, we yeah. I was thinking maybe it would be interesting to um, read some of the. The same, like the loose leaf lettuces out of the mm. burpee catalog. Yeah. Give me, is this burpee? Yeah. Man, these look delicious. Mm. And I mean, one of those is an heirloom variety mm. that they're selling. Okay. I'm going to read some for the uh, purposes of contrast out of the burpee. So Allison has been reading out of Seed Saver, which. Yeah, well, so the Seed Savers Exchange is actually a nonprofit, mm. and they're with the mission being to preserve biological diversity in our food sources. Mm. So they've got a pretty different approach. All right, so the first one listed under this heading is dynamite, uh, and it has like a graphic that indicates that it is uh, new. They are newly carrying it. It's highlighted. Um, there's a, I don't know, emoji type thing with a check mark inside of a, a planter of sorts. A <laughs> um, lot of information. And here's the description. Dynamite is the cream of the butterhead crop, a standout for sweet flavor. Beta carotene payload... <laughs> An unprecedented, take-on-all-comers blight resistance, packed with overlapping, soft, rounded, scrumptious leaves. Dynamite adds pizzazz to salads and sandwiches. Plant in succession for seasons of delectable butterheads. Dynamite's 8-10 to inch plants nimbly fend off lettuce enemies, resisting aphids, lettuce mosaic virus, and water molds. So definitely if we get sued, it'll be by Burpee. Burpee, yeah. (laughs) 
Um, I mean, it's not as if I never buy their seeds. Sometimes I'm sorry. You know, take on all comers, blight resistance. Look, they they just they don't have the same caliber of copywriter. <laughs> I mean, first of all, they're clearly overstating the blight resistance of this game. <laughs> Second of all, I would love to be described in that mm. way. Here's here's how that. From my from my experience, copywriting and copy editing in the past, how that reads to me is that the it was, lady doth protest too much. It was written by someone who doesn't have a garden. Mm. Like whoever whoever wrote that copy does not know <laughs> or care about blight. <laughs> <laughs> Take on all comers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wait, why don't you read that corn just for giggles? Mm. Is that in this catalog? Yeah. It's I think oh, it's Jaws. the very yeah, first okay. page. Alright, we decided to move from <laughs> loose leaf lettuces to corn. Just as an illustration. As an illustration of the burpees we're gonna get sued by burpees. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the burpee style of, of copywriting. Um, so this is a corn. It is, claims to be a burpee exclusive. There's a graphic to go along with it. It's called Jaws Sweet Corn. And it's being like... There's the picture of it, it dwarfs all other things, I think, that there are pictures of in this entire catalog. It takes mm -hmm. up the majority of a page... It's a hand gripping it like a cock. Like, that's all... It's the only analog you could possibly draw. I guess we have to put, like, a not safe for work on this if we include it. Mm. But anyway, there's a hand jerking off this corn like it's a dick. Uh... Maybe not all the episodes need to be... Need to have explicit content. Okay. But... Well, the explicit content comes in this copy. <laughs> Oh, man, this first line is groan-inducing. Okay. Jaws hybrid. Your eyes will not believe your ears. This summer's blockbuster yields stunning, larger-than-life ears. Twelve inches long, six inches round, up to a hundred percent larger than other varieties. Jaws delivers a cornucopia of delectable deep-set kernels, bursting with old-fashioned heirloom flavor. Two golden-yellow giant-sized ears can be broken in half very easily to fit your standard boiling pot. Double sow seeds to guarantee a hundred ears from every packet. The idea of corn so big it won't fit in your <laughs> right. pot to cook it. Yeah. Our corn is so big <laughs> it's an inconvenience to you. You have to break it in order for it to fit in a pot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we touched on this earlier, but um, like, Burpees has a lot of, like, talking about how big shit is. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe at a farmer's market you do well if you have a huge ear of corn. I don't know, but well, if you're selling your produce by weight, then I mean, big is good, um, right? Because people, I guess, you know, you only buy, especially with something like corn, because you can only buy integer units of corn. You know, it seems like a corn, like a cob of corn by mass, though, is probably more inedible material than it is mm. edible material and the larger it, apart from any taste issue the larger it gets the greater the ratio of inedible fibrous material to corn yeah i mean i i i guess the advantage of selling it is just you know if people are gonna buy four ears of corn if you're charging per ear it doesn't really matter but if you're charging per pound then you want your ears to be as big as possible. Right. Anyway, I'm emasculated by that corn description. I don't know. About there's you. more. There's there's even more. Big guy hybrid. Sorry, that's a pepper. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just remember having felt some outrage on the the corn page, but that was because they wanted you to grow corn in a flower pot on your deck. (laughs) And, you know, I just, there's a certain amount, there's a certain number of corn plants you have to have to get decent pollination. Otherwise, they're just... There's a tall that, grass. Right? There's an, you're not gonna. Let me see this. They've they've illustrated the idea. Yeah. Oh my god, that's so stupid looking. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's technically possible to grow corn in a pot, but the most likely outcome is that you have a pot of very tall grass and get no edible corn. I don't think they measure things. I'm going to read you a, hmm. a description here. This is of a sweet corn. It's called Silver Choice Hybrid, also a burpee exclusive. It's amazing how many plants burpee has a monopoly on. But Well, they develop them. Mm. That's like their deal. Uh, okay, Silver Choice Hybrid. The new silver standard. That's in square quotes for whatever reason. The new silver standard is over two weeks earlier and at least 20% sweeter than Silver Queen. Pearly white, eight-inch ears. Uh, do you think that when they are writing things like at least 20% sweeter than, mm. that they have measured the sugar content of it? Or you think they're just fucking bullshitting? No, I, I assume they're... I mean, that's the... If they've got an improved corn... They've got an improved sweet corn. Increasing the sugar content is, I mean, that's the thing they're trying to do. So I'm sure that they have people quantifying that increase in sugar content because that's that's the science that well, they're trying. Well, how sweet do you want? Your, it's like when, when you, they're making, we've been buying, what apples? Jazz apples? Mm. Envy. Envy. They're like the they're, new. Yeah, they're these new, uh, you know, genetically engineered apples that have really stormed the market lately, and we've been buying envy apples, and they are they are sweet, but they, like, you can't just increase the sweetness forever. Like, you have to balance it with other um, flavor. Like, it's also somehow both tartar and sweeter than most other varieties that, I, and I wonder if. What, what other flavor notes are they going for in corn besides just more sugar content? Well, so what's what's actually most important in corn, uh, by saying it's 20% sweeter, I assume they mean at the moment it's plucked from the plant, though it's hard to know. Maybe they mean something else by that. Mm. Um, because the sugars convert into starches very quickly. Like the moment you pick the ear of corn, the sugars start to convert into starch. And corn that has uh, like a slower rate of conversion of its sugars into starches is actually mm. the, that's the sweeter corn. So it just doesn't decay as rapidly once it's off the vine. It doesn't break down as rapidly once it's off the vine. Yeah, I guess. I don't know if I would, I don't even know if it really qualifies as decay. Um, pick a vegetable. Oh gosh, uh, cauliflower? Okay. Is that available? Yeah, I'm sure it's available. It might be on the broccoli page. (laughs) It's corruption. No, they're the same thing. Are they? Yeah, they really are. I was always led to believe that, like, Fruits and vegetables that were of a bold color mm. were somehow had, like, a more nutrition. Is that true? Which would make cauliflower bullshit compared to broccoli. I think it's fine. <laughs> Is it fine? Yeah. <laughs> huh. Let's see. Uh-huh. They've actually... So, see this? The only entry they've got in their physical catalog... For cauliflower is what a lot of people consider to be a, a broccoli, um, mm. which is that Romanescu that broccoli, yeah. the the fractal, mm-hmm. the awesome fractal broccoli. That's a cauliflower? They're the same thing. 
This catalog is calling it a cauliflower. This this catalog has designated a, a cauliflower. Hmm. Um, the mild, nutty flavor and crunchy texture of this green Romanesco type cauliflower is as remarkable as its unique spiraled appearance. Fresh green florets spiral up to form a cone-shaped head for late summer and fall harvest. A great fresh treat even the kids will like. Hmm. I don't even mind the it's a great fresh treat even the kids will like. I think that's fine. Hmm. It's the as blank as it is blank. I think is the one moment where that copy didn't work for me. But I think it's, I think this is in between Burpees mm. and the other, and the other catalog is less appealing to me. Yeah, I just I get the sense that whoever that they, they've, I don't know. I if I just continue to cast aspersions upon Burpee as a company. <laughs> um, People are going to start to think this is political. <laughs> um, just, I assume that they outsource their copywriting. <laughs> <laughs> like, probably someone who graduated from college in the last 12 months um, writes that copy and is monitored by consensual spyware while they do so, um, because that was part of my copywriting experience. Mm. Um, I, I, I imagine that it's farmed out in a similar way. Did they, when you did that, they, did they monitor, they monitored your real time progress? They, they did. So you were paid, uh, by like by the minute, basically. <laughs> So you're you're you know you had an hourly wage, but they tracked you, like the number of keystrokes that you made, and if you didn't make enough keystrokes in a minute, then you would lose credit for working that minute, which meant that it was really hard to uh, spend time actually thinking about the product you were trying to describe. You had to. Could you game the system by? Typing like "fuck you, fuck you, fuck you" real quick, and then deleting it all. Yeah, I mean, if I needed time to think, then I could just like press the same key over and over again, or something oh. on another um, part of my document. But well, it's just, it just it was incredibly frustrating because if you wanted to do a good job, the system they were using, like the system of rewards they were reward using, that, yeah. was not. Yeah, it would. It was not going to reward good, thoughtful copy, mm -hmm. and in fact, kind of discouraged that. Yeah, so I, I just, I, I assume that's what's going down at Burpee. Seeds of Change. Seeds of Change. Seeds of Change. Twenty sixteen. Yeah. yeah, I like Seeds of Change. Um, pick another. Pick another vegetable. Oh, uh, green beans. Oh yeah, green beans. It's probably my favorite vegetable. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, your favorite food, anyone's favorite food, is like mostly a nostalgia choice. Mm. And I uh, have strong memories of eating green beans out of cans uh, when I was a kid with my family. Uh, I still quite enjoy them. And they taste, of course, nothing like green beans. They taste like salty, mushy nubs. <laughs> <laughs> but even saying that is sort of making me salivate a little bit. Yeah, so my, my family, when I was growing up, we always grew and canned our own green beans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't sound like my family at all. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're like they come out of the back out of the jar and they're still crisp and mm -hmm. good. Maxi Bell. This fancy French fillet bean is long and slender with fabulous flavor and tenderness. Pick the beans when pencil thick for your delicious gourmet creations. 
50 to 55 days to mature, 6 to 7 inch pods, 16 to 20 inch plants. Yeah, I like that. I like, I think it's nice when there's a line that's like, um, it's not just advertising the plant, but it's saying, once you have it, here's a, here's a hot tip to get mm. the most of it. Yeah. Um, like it's, it's letting you have further insider information or something like that. Like that, I think that mm. always draws me in. Yeah. And then I think it's, I think it's makes for more effective uh, advertising copy too, because if you can get a person imagining what their life will be like mm. when they when they possess that green bean, that's what they say if you're if you're if you run a if you're a merchant and you sell a product, you got to get your 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 customers to touch the product, right? They, mm. like your odds of mm. making a sale increase dramatically if the person you're trying to sell to physically handles it. Uh, but I would imagine that if you are able to force your customer to imagine uh, dealing with it Mm. in some way, managing it, uh, then that probably has the same effect. Yeah, like how will this fit into your life? You can imagine yourself. And I think a lot of people, a lot of avid gardeners buy their seeds in the cold winter months when they're fantasizing about the Mm. time, Mm -hmm. a few months in the future when they'll be working in the garden and it'll be spring and summer and not winter Mm -hmm. so if you can spin a kind of fantasy then i think that's probably effective advertising yeah it's probably what we're doing i mean uh we're recording this on the first day of wait is this the first day of spring no it's just daylight savings time changing yeah but we've been fantasizing certainly about it. it just got cold for the first time this winter uh after a troublingly warm uh, series of months. I think this has led me to fantasize more about gardening than mm. I otherwise would have. Mm. Let me get one out of that. Yeah, why don't you read a couple more green beans? Which one did you just read? The first one, Maxi Bell. Oh, yeah. Okay. Blue Lake. Highly regarded for exceptional taste and tenderness, this 1961 All-America Selections winner remains widely popular for its high yield of sweet, round, stringless beans on vigorous plants. Mm. The meaty texture makes them a great choice for canning and freezing. Sweet, round, vigorous, is that? Sweet, round, stringless beans Mm. on vigorous plants. Hmm. There's that line in the um, uh, James Joyce Nora letters where he's describing her farts erotically and he calls them sweet little merry cracks. Mm, yeah. Uh, and it's got like a little of that glow on it. I think this line's got a little of that glow. Yeah, it has It has a good... Sweet round stringless beans on vigorous plants. Mm. Yeah, it's got some good tempo. Like whoever wrote that has an ear for words Mm -hmm. on the other hand i don't know that i'm impressed by this being a 1961 all america selections winner i don't know what that i don't know what that means either (laughs) i don't know what that is it's like a person who's the i don't know it's like some fucking midwestern dad who was like in 1961 i threw the winning touchdown pass on my high school football team it seems like I don't know. If you haven't done anything since 1961. Uh, I think it's a, that's a classic green bean. Okay. Yes. I think it has fair claim to being a classic mm. green bean. I mean, what is this? We should really do some research, I guess, on what this competition is. There's probably some of these, probably a thing that some of these say is, this is one X prize and Y competition. And we should know whether to treat that with gravity or not. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be something to research ahead of time. I, I suspect that in many cases it is similar to the Blue Ribbon won by Pabst. Right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, I'll read one more. Royal Burgundy. 
Gorgeous deep purple bean pods that look great on vegetable platters are produced early and abundantly on these stocky, insect-resistant plants that do well even in cooler conditions. The delicious, round, stringless beans turn green when cooked, but maintain their flavor and meaty texture. This Mm. seems like the point to bring up the description of various vegetables as meaty. Yeah. And whether that is supposed to be appealing. <laughs> like, not to say that people who enjoy vegetables don't often enjoy meats also, or some people who are looking for a meat replacements, probably not in green beans, but uh, I am personally grossed out by the description of vegetables as meaty. I know they're just trying to say, like, dense and... Yeah. Like, dense, thick. chewy... Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know that it has some some resistance maybe to your teeth. Mm-hmm. They're trying to describe some kind of sensation, but I agree that meaty isn't what I want out of a green bean. Or there must be some <laughs> other word to describe it because when it's coming from a green bean, um, it's hard to it's hard to you can't take that take seriously. Seriously, yeah. the idea that it's meaty, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, where's we should pull out that eggplant. You were really, you were really bothered by that. That's in the burpee catalog. Is it? Of course, it's yeah. the fucking burpee catalog. God damn it! Um, and again, I'm not like it's not like I'm a uh, uh, militant vegetarian or anything like that. I just think even meat. If you were to describe, if you were going to describe a delicious piece of fried chicken, you wouldn't be like this fried chicken is meaty as hell. Right? Like, it's not really an appealing... You want to not think of it as meat, maybe, when you're enjoying it? I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but I guess you wouldn't say it for chicken because you already know that it's meaty by yeah. definition. No one describes meat as meaty, but... All right, mm. here's this... Meatball. Yeah, okay. So this is from the burp. It's a burpee exclusive. Exclusive. Burpee exclusive. Um... It is a is an eggplant. It is called the meatball hybrid. Already gross. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I forgot what this next line is, and I began to gag. <laughs> All right. I have to start over. Let me let me take a stab at it. Let me take All a stab right. at I'm it. I'm gonna hand this to you. I've got it here. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, Go. I've got another. I've got the oh, 2017 it's sickening. Burpee. I'm sorry. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Imagine fresh, homegrown, vine ripened. <laughs> oh, no, I can't do it either. <laughs> Hold on. For the purposes of ASMR, people, oh, you have to no. get a good, clean read of All this. Right. <clears throat> the mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got this. Here we go. <laughs> Meatball hybrid. <laughs> Meatball hybrid. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this podcast it's is really so hard. <laughs> Meatball hybrid. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. <laughs> Okay. Do so much okay, okay, okay. The mightiest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. Imagine fresh, homegrown, <laughs> vine ripened <laughs> meat. <laughs> That's meatball. Fruits, dense, moist, flavorful flesh captures the flavor and texture of meat (laughs) as no other eggplant or any vegetable can. Super flavorful, large five-inch fruits are virtuosos of versatility. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Imagine fresh, homegrown, vine-ripened meat. (laughs) <laughs> the thing is, once we get past, the, once once you get past the second sentence, it's fine. It's All right, the so second hard. sentence is the worst. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> the mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Imagine fresh, homegrown, vine-ripened meat. That's meatball. Fruit's dense, moist, flavorful flesh captures the flavor and texture of meat as no other eggplant or any vegetable can. Super flavorful, large five-inch fruits are virtuosos of versatility. I really wanted to read it in like a porny sounding kind of voice, but I just I can't even make it through Why because the idea it? of meat ripening on the <laughs> vine is so horrible. <laughs> like mm. the idea that you would have chunks of meat rotting hanging in the, in the sun. sun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just crawling down the side of your house. All right. Well, this entire thing has to be cut. There's no way. I can. We'll maybe. This be able isn't to make, soothing. We'll be able to make a version of this. Okay. Why don't you read it once and I'll make noises during it. Wait. Try not to make noises during oh, it. Okay. I was gonna go. I don't think that makes it. I don't think that enhances. The mightiest, meatiest eggplant ever. Imagine fresh, homegrown, vine-ripened meat. That's meatball. Fruit's dense, moist, flavorful flesh captures the flavor and texture of meat as no other eggplant or any vegetable can. Super flavorful, large, five-inch fruits are virtuosos of versatility. Good job. Like, what kills me, it's like, what I'm actually laughing at is after that sentence about meat rotting <laughs> in, in the summer sun. It's like, colon, that's meatball. <laughs> <laughs> I know! I know! I know! Oh, man. And I mean that that's part of the reason why I think that this is like some poor schmuck mm. just out of college because another one of the things that we were judged on for our copywriting they wanted a they wanted variation of sentence structure and vocabulary but it was it could be satisfied in a trivial way mm -hmm. so when I was then Editing. It's like beating a standardized test or something. Yeah. So, which, like, when I was later editing other people's copy, it was full of lazy shit like that because, again, that's what the algorithm encouraged. Right. It was like, oh, this is a, a variation of sentence length and structure. Mm. Those kind of guidelines like and constraints yeah. and formulas. Therefore... Creating a minimum standard of quality, but the unintended effect is they also create a maximum standard of mm. quality, and yeah, that's the... That's meatball. <laughs> <laughs> that's meatball. <laughs> Jazz hands. Um, Alright, give me the good cat. I want to read something out of the good cat. Okay. I want to read something out of the... Seed Savers Exchange. Seed Savers, yeah. I gotta not... Gotta be a little more judicious about it. If I read something that's not a food... Hmm, flowers. Flowers, yeah. yeah. Flowers would be nice. Here is, we are in Midwestern Prairie Mixes. Uh, the Lupinus perennis, the lupine. Lupine's dense spires of bright blue flowers signal the coming of spring. Lupine is the only food plant for the larvae of the endangered Carner blue butterfly. Plants grow two feet tall on sandy loams to very dry sandy soils. Will not grow well in clay soils. Perennial. Hardy to zone for. Yeah, it seems like these um, flowers, uh, the format for these is indicating the the um, insects that it is most effective at attracting. Mm, yeah. Um, though, though lupin is also a legume. So it... Is it? Yeah. 
So that's another benefit that seems not to be mentioned. They're, they're advertising it as perennial yeah. or annual. I don't. Oh, um, I mean, it's Lupinus perennis, so I assume perennial. Hmm. Perennial. Yeah. This is interesting to me. And again, we're in seed savers. Um, so you gotta assume they have judicious use of hyperbole. <laughs> um, it's the Mongolian giant. It's a sunflower. One of the largest mm. seeded varieties available to gardeners. Seeds up to one and a half inches long. Great for eating. Plants can grow 12 to 14 feet tall with gigantic yellow heads reaching 16 to 18 inches across. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. They earned it. They did earn it. It's deserved. I, I'm, I'm fond of these sunflower descriptions I think in general. Mm. The giant primrose, a.k.a. the moonwalker. Mm. Multiple blossoms high on sturdy top branching, 8 to 12 foot tall plants. Flowers have soft, creamy, pale ye- yellow petals with a dark chocolate center. Mm. Great when used as a living screen or windbreak. Sunflowers especially have, I think, nice descriptions and names. Hmm. Wish that I'd do a great reading of that. Lemon Queen? Is Lemon Queen there? Yes. Yeah, let's hear some Lemon Queen. Produces Lemon Queen. Produces an abundance of multiple blooms with large lemon yellow petals and dark chocolate centers. Sturdy plants grow up to 10 feet tall. I just think that's a nice name. Hmm. Uh, yeah, here's another one that that gets at your interaction with it in some way. Mm. The Valentine. Bred by Dr. Kovacs of Budapest, Hungary. Beautiful, soft, primrose yellow petals with rounded tips, dark brown central disc. Plants grow five feet tall, many side branches produce five to six inch flowers. Cut flowers can last seven to ten days. Mm. For longer-lasting bouquets of flowers, be sure to pick heads that are just about to open. <laughs> it's an interesting name for a flower. The outhouse hollyhock. Mm, no, but that's classically where hollyhocks were planted. Mm. Because they're very tall. Man, this is your, your brain's separation. The Outhouse Hollyhock. This classic variety has graced outbuildings on Iowa farmsteads for over a century. Years ago, refined ladies just looked for the hollyhocks and didn't have to ask where the outhouse was. Single blooms of white, light pink, magenta, and burgundy. Blooms the second year in the north, or first year in more moderate climates. Yeah. I like that a lot. My great grandmother loved hollyhocks. Mm. What an elegant way to write. You just pissed where the hollyhocks are. <laughs> well, what an even more elegant way to say piss here. Mm. Uh, to just plant a hedge of hollyhocks mm-hmm. as a sign. Mm. Blue Boy Bachelor's Buttons. Brought to America from Europe in the 17th century, and known to have been cultivated by Thomas Jefferson in his gardens at Monticello. Well-maintained strain with blue flowers. Plants will bloom throughout the growing season. Remarkably easy to grow. Dries well. Oh, man. Sensation cosmos mixture. Hmm. Yeah, that's better than the description. Here, let me give this back to you. These are good, though. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Mm, seashells cosmos mixture. Those flowers are cool. The petals are curled into a kind of cone. Hmm. Um... What should I read? Mm. I, I mean, I think like a lot of the descriptions in that area were looking beautiful to me, but mm. it's up to you. 
Black Velvet Nasturtium Intense velvety black flower, a completely unique color within this genus. Dwarf 10 to 12 inch plants are ideal for containers. For a great contrast, try adding blossoms to your fresh spring salads. Hardy annual. Ladybird nasturtium. Eye-catching orange-yellow flowers with bright red central markings. Edible flowers like all other nasturtiums. Dwarf plants are ideal for container gardening, but will also thrive in normal garden conditions. Hardy annual, 8 to 10 inches tall. Milkmaid Nasturtium. This is the closest to white of any nasturtium available to gardeners, unique within the genus. Many years of selection have gone into producing this pale cream to yellow white variety. A great conversation piece in any garden. Okay, well let's uh let's call it a wrap. Alright. Do we wanna have we learned any lessons? Yeah, I've learned that when you want to make meat its most delicious, you should tie it to a piece of string and hang it from the side of your house for a period of time. Um, I've learned that people like meat in ball form. You learned a lot that. about meat today. I don't think we learned much about meat today, but... We're about to eat a dinner of fondue with bread. You can't tell anyone that. Is that shameful? Well, no. I mean, you I don't... Good. You've kept... I mean, it's been such a warm winter that our... Per- Maybe we, uh, Here's a segment. Mm. It should be like... What's in the garden What's now? in the garden? Yeah. What's in the garden? Da. <laughs> yeah. Our, the garden's been, been productive all winter. Mm. Um, it's because our world is... Ruined. Well, sure. <laughs> I mean... I mean, you were away for a couple months in Australia where it is summer, and... I don't need these people to know that about me. Well, why don't you tell them your social security number, too? They don't need... Mine is 04276-5095. Don't even I don't want to cut that, that out. It m- what if I just cut out the middle couple numbers? Don't you dare. Well, we'll talk about it. No, it's a really stupid idea. Okay. <laughs> I mean, actually, well, it's not that bad for you to publicize your social yeah, security it's number my life's bad. because your credit is so ruined that mm. people probably couldn't take out credit cards in your name. Right. But if they did, they would be only the most predatory kinds <laughs> of loans. So. I'd prefer you not do that. All right. We'll see how many. What we're going to do later is negotiate how many of those numbers I have to bleep out. All. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I think a what's in the garden what's segment is good. What's in the garden now? Yeah. Um, so it's been mostly winter, but not really winter. We have like a lot of good salad greens. There's some mustard greens out there. We've been having big salads every night. Yeah, we've got we've got chard, we've got kale, we've got mustards, we've got a lot of lettuce coming up. We've been having some of that Amish deer tongue actually. Mm. Um, it's real soft. Is that the soft stuff? Yeah, the yeah. kind of like really tender. Mm-hmm. I I think it's been it's been a little too cold for it actually. Mm. Um, yeah, we have a huge variety of different leaf lettuces and romaine lettuces. Mm. Um, we've got some peas that are struggling along. Those have been there all winter. Yeah, they over they I overwintered. Think they're yeah. Oh yeah, they're not gonna be they're not gonna make food. Um they're just and and then uh, we've got some buckwheat um starting to sprout, I noticed. Mm. And that is just for a uh, green manure. Which is what those peas are going to be. Hmm. Um, What's on the docket? And then the oh, the other thing worth mentioning in the garden is that the blueberry bushes are already have buds, and the, Wait, are blueberries going to happen? 
I don't think so. I bet they're not. They were sort of, they were, we thought they were getting stolen by birds. Yeah, so we're definitely going to put bird netting over them this year. But I think we have a few problems. I think we have a problem of, um, this year we may well have a problem of chill hours. Mm -hmm. Like blueberries are one of those plants that needs to be cold for a certain number of hours to make fruit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we've hit even kind of the lowest target for that. Mm. Um, Also, it may just be that we don't have enough bushes for them to really pollinate pollinate well and then i think yeah the birds come along and steal every almost ripe blueberry when Mm. we do get some right so we'll we'll put a net over them this year and see what happens but i don't think it'll be a conclusive experiment Mm. um we've got little leaves on the peach tree and the lilac tree is starting to get some little leaves you should take on the peach tree well, it already idea? snowed on it, so okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the garden update, I mm. guess. All right, I want to eat some hot cheese now. Mm. This has been... Oh, we don't have a name. We'll, f- we'll, we'll have to come up with a name and then record some sort of intro. Yeah, and... I'll write a jingle. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, and right. sign off. This has been Roman. And Allison. And also Lucy's a cat. She's still here, yeah. She's been here the whole time. But not because she's interested. Because she sits on this cushion for 18 hours a day. <laughs> Alright. See you next time. Bye. It's CD Business. It's CD Business.